Colin, first, my congratulations as the first professor of neuroscience and philosophy in the UK, maybe the world. Uh, I studied neuroscience, I studied philosophy, but never could bring them together. So I think this is terrific. However, some scientists, friends of mine, very famous names that you would know, have said to me, philosophy is very important for one reason, to keep the rest of philosophy off my back. That's what they say. What do you say? There's been an uncomfortable relationship between philosophy and science um, for a relatively short period of time. Let's, let's not forget that science has so origin from sure. philosophy, natural philosophy was, as it was called. And you have to ask, what is it, what, what is, what's the aim of philosophy? And it is, I think, to explore the nature of ideas, a platonic notion, um, and the origin of those ideas and the distinction between uh, truth and falsehood. So it focuses on many different issues. First of all, on the clarity of argument, mm -hmm. um, rational philosophy and logic, um, on how to discover facts through thinking and reasoning, um, and that, of course, is an area where science has very significantly extended the kinds of questions that can be asked. Instead of sitting in an armchair reflecting on what might be the case, you can go out and you know, look under a microscope or perform an experiment of some sort. Um, there's a big overlap, of course, between physics and uh, mathematics and, and philosophy, which is, which is well established. I think what we're seeing now is the invasion of philosophical territory by many, many other areas of science, but most particularly by neuroscience. Some philosophers have found this very threatening and retreat, I think, to, as it were, philosophical diktats, claims of territory, areas that science will never invade, often resorting to sort of Wittgensteinian arguments about the significance of language, of words. Um, other philosophers are playing the game and see the potential for essentially creating a new form of philosophy and certainly adding to the richness of neuroscience by posing kinds of questions that perhaps people with a biological or medical background might not think of posing. Mm. What are some of those? Well, of course, consciousness and how it works is a, is mm. a very obvious one. Uh, the nature of knowledge, uh, what it means um, to say that you've proven something by an experiment. Can we ever really pr prove ideas? Um, is there such a thing as truth and falsehood? Are ideas right and right and wrong? Is, um, Are there laws of nature, not just regularities that you keep discovering over and over again? Yeah. And are concepts like morality and um, ethics in some way represented within neural structures? Mm -hmm. Can we give physical accounts of concepts mm -hmm. like that? Mm -hmm. So I see a, a very rich possibility of interaction, which will certainly not just be one way, not just neuroscience invading more and more of philosophy. Well, I think many philosophers uh, will accept the the reality of neuroscience, but there are many scientists, not just neuroscientists, physicists too, who just think philosophy is, uh, is an archaic burden. It may have been what gave rise to science, but it, it is now the old generation who should, will and should die. Well, it is interesting that, you know, we have this subject called philosophy of science, a right. very respectable academic uh, discipline. There are professorships and students take it and so on. There's very little interaction between the philosophy right. of science and, right. and right. active scientists. It's right. curious, really. Right. Um, well, I mean, it's very I, telling. I would, I would, it, it, is, it is telling and worrying. I mean, one problem is territoriality. Another is that, um, you know, it's just a whole lot of other stuff to get your head around. It's difficult enough to keep up with science. Yeah, if you're true. told that that's there are true. other disciplines that you're going to determine right. how you do or understand right. science, that's, that's, that's tough going. So a lot of the difficulty on both sides, the sort of jousting between science and philosophy, has to do with them um, wanting to maintain some sort of territorial control and also not being willing to face the challenge of understanding the huge background of knowledge and literature and so on on both sides, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. need to be appreciated mm -hmm. before there could be a real dialogue. Mm -hmm. But it's asymmetric because uh, I think most philosophers agree they need to understand science, but it's not clear that most scientists think they need to understand philosophy. No, no, I think you're right. Yeah. And uh, I would disagree with that profoundly. You, you would disagree. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think the philosophy helps to sharpen the way in which questions are asked, enable scientists to do something they should really do, which is to rank the importance and the significance of the questions mm. that they ask, to so distinguish the big questions from the, you know, from the trivial ones. Philosophy, philosophy helps a great deal with that, particularly in, in the area that I'm especially interested in, which is epistemology, theory of knowledge, 
how we actually gain our knowledge of the world, mm. what matters. You know, if, if uh, the great empirical philosophers, you know, Berkeley, Hume and so on, had had microelectrodes, they would have been neuroscientists, no doubt about <laughs> it, because the kinds of issues that they were thinking about, how do brains capture right, ideas right. and knowledge, right. are exactly the kinds of things that neuroscientists are interested right. in. Right, yeah, Hume trying to find the self and only finding perceptions and his bundle theory and yes. that, you know, I mean, he would have, he would have uh, said, I'm going to give this up for a while and uh, do some uh, yeah. electrode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, then, you know, the relationship between subjective experience and just uh, physical processes. Newton, Newton, you know, uh, very great scientist that he was, was, was very concerned with that, the realizing that the colors of the spectrum that we see our subjective experiences have nothing to do right. with the light, right. Right. except that you know, it, it correlates with differences in Different. the vibration pattern of right. light. It becoming even more complicated when, for, say, Thomas Young discovered that uh, a red light can be created by an infinite different combinations of, of mm. wavelengths, everything mm. from a monochrom monochromatic, absolutely pure mm. wavelength, mm. which looks red, to, to combinations of, of mm. lights of different mm. wavelengths, mm. which have exactly the same subjective experience. Mm. So subjectivity doesn't map in a simple way onto mm. physics. Your own work in epistemology certainly seems like a bullseye target mm. for combining philosophy and neuroscience. Yes. So t tell me what kind of progress you, you would like to see in epistemology. <laughs> Well, the one obvious question is how um, objects and things are recognized for their own integrity, uh, their own value, how they're labeled and described. How does the neutral image falling on the retina become passed and interpreted by the brain in terms of objects and significances attached to them? I mean, our knowledge of the world is largely that. Sure. What are things? Uh, what threats and opportunities do they pose for us? Mm -hmm. Those are big epistemological questions, and neuroscience can address those. They become computational questions rather than just philosophical questions. But then reflect back on the philosophy. And you see an iterative yes. process where then that would help clarify that data coming in would enable the philosopher to ask more precise questions? Well, exactly. So philosophers, for instance, have been very interested in, I mean, Descartes, for instance, was very interested in the, the figments of vision, the false interpretations, seeing faces in the in the flames of a fire or mm. something like this. Mm. I think there might be something almost magical about that. Mm. Well, we can now give interpretive um, uh, explanations of mm. those sorts of phenomena in terms of brain processes, mm. bringing together you know, important philosophical problems with an understanding of how the brain works.